good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us for this Rejuvenate uh, virtual hike in the Master Forest. My name is Wayne Terryberry, and I'm the Outdoor Recreation Coordinator uh, and Natural Lands Coordinator for the Master University. And uh, it's a great time. I'm really excited to be involved with the Alumni Advancement uh, Rejuvenate series. And it is spring. We're all excited about the turn of plants and the turn of life and warm weather and what what better way that to rejuvenate that of uh, talking about nature and a hike. Uh, during this uh, virtual hike I will be joined and I'm very pleased to be joined by uh, Noah Stegman and Rob Porter who are both McMaster alumni and I'll let them introduce themselves when we uh, when they talk about certain aspects, uh, whether it's birds or trees or research, their areas of specialty. So uh, I want to give you a little background about this area. So this is McMaster Forest here, and you can see how lovely it is in the distance. It's 115 acres of natural lands, very ecologically diverse, very significant habitat. Very, and uh, it's a wonderful place. We do have walking trails around it, and the university has been using it for education and for research. But we also have a lot of visitors come out to use the trails, and certainly welcome you to do that. And uh, hopefully, in the near future, we can get out on a, on a hike with it, any of you who are interested. So, a little bit of history of the area. Um, the uh, we don't have a lot of records about the indigenous. Uh, habitation or use of the property, although we can pretty much hypothesize that based on the fact that it's a table land with uh, creeks on both sides and at the very far end, Ancaster Creek coming through from the Dundas Valley and then into Coots Paradise down near our lower campus, that with table land and the water courses it would have been a very popular place. In addition, there are significant uh, historical travel routes in the area that are very close over down Wilson Street and uh, through the Dundas Valley. So you know there have been a lot of travel through here. So but we don't have any archaeological evidence of it, but we certainly can hypothesize on that. So it was uh, first really settled here by the Mullen family in the 1800s, who lived just down the road. And actually had a house off to the other side, to my left. And they had a farm here for a hundred years or so. And we're going to show you a satellite image right now, 1954. And you can see from the, uh, sorry, the aerial photo of the land and how it was laid out in the farm plots. With the, you can probably see on this map the farm road that goes through it. A good friend of mine, uh, Al Beattie, who lives just down the road, he actually worked on this farm in the 1950s. He tells the stories about picking potatoes and driving the horses through the property, etc. So it was a very significant farm property. In the early 1960s, McMullen sold it to a developer. And what they did was they um, removed a huge hill that was out here front of the property and you can see just behind you can see the remnants uh, of the hill coming through and it would have gone through there so they removed that they did some uh, bulldozing really kind of uh, disturbed the soils quite a bit but due to the kind of the wet landscape of it I think was the justification for them to decide not to do any development so Around 1965, 66, McMaster University purchased this land and all of the uh, uh, floodplain of Ancaster Creek just passed here from basically lower campus all the way to old, old Ancaster Road, which is off to the west. And the idea for this property was to make it a satellite campus for the university with potential ideas of growth. That idea didn't last very long, which uh, is probably a very good thing, considering the ecological significance of this area. So from the late 60s until about 2012, kind of sat on the shelf, and many people at the university actually forgot we really owned it. So it sat here for a long time. 
And then about 2012, 2013, myself and some faculty members brought it to the president's attention about how we have this very uh, exceptional natural property in the Dundas Valley that we could use as a resource. So we initiated some research, pro some research and some education, which you'll learn a bit more about later. But if you look at the view here, uh, for me, this is incredibly exciting because when I came here before 2012, and especially 2012, all you could see was whole grassland you see now was a buckthorn thicket with 11 acres of buck, European buck, which is an incredibly invasive uh, shrub, which prohibits some other plants from coming underneath. And it really, they don't look great. And it took over this whole property in the front, which had been disturbed, and buckthorn is very invasive that way, would take over the properties that had been disturbed and left. So we had about, what, 50 odd years to grow. A lot of them were very big. So 2013, uh, myself, a faculty member, staff, especially Susan Dudley, Chad Harvey, the uh, uh, Department of Biology, we spent a year on a bunch of those folks doing volunteers clearing the buckthorn piles and burning a lot of it and leaving some uh, piles of old buckthorn for habitat for rabbits and birds and such but cleared it all up, opened it right up as far as you can pretty much see from this video and then through the biology department especially Susan Dudley and Stephen Weber and Chad I mentioned and others graduate students we, there's a project initiated to sow it into a prairie savanna grassland, which are fairly rare in the Hamilton region. And I'm very excited to say that now it's grown up to be the biggest prairie savanna grassland segment in the Hamilton region. And it's incredibly great to see that. Every three or four years, like for prairie savannas, we do a prescribed burn to burn the dead, dead uh, grass and any trees that are trying to grow back up or small buckthorn to allow nutrients to go back into the soil and to allow fresh grasslands species to grow back up. So that's a little bit of background about the history and uh, we're going to now go for a walk and I want to uh, highlight a couple of things as we walk along the trails. You're going to see maps, uh, identification, but uh, as uh, you can see here the the left side, this way, is west, that is the east and the north, and this property is really divided up into two, a front area and a back area. So you can see a lot of the front here, but there's some lovely, significant old trees at the very back, which we'll show you. So I just wanted to highlight a little of the orientation, but you'll see these on maps. And uh, secondly, uh, we're going to stop and start as we go along. Uh, Noah and Rob and I, you won't see us together. We'll be videotaping each other to maintain social distancing uh, to uh, make sure we're doing this safe and properly. So that is really kind of the highlights and we'll do some conclusion and at the end of the full video we'll have a chance to talk about uh, a little bit of question and answers, things you may have. So I'm excited about getting started and uh, I'll let uh, Noah assume once we go down the trail here to the west talk a little bit about the prairie savanna grasslands. Thanks and thank you for coming on our hikes and let's get going. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Noah. I am a master's student at McMaster in, I'm studying biology in the Dudley lab. I'm also a Mac alum from my undergrad so today we're out here in the prairie area of Mac Forest and there's a number of different prairie grasses that we have growing here. The prairie was started in 2014 with a seeding project uh, by McMaster biology staff and students. And then every three years since then, we've been doing prescribed burns that help um, seed germinate. So my name is Rob. I'm with the Hamilton Naturalist Club and uh, we do some work with McMaster Forests and the McMaster Natural Lands Committee um, to uh, do these bluebird boxes and uh, bioacoustics monitoring 
and uh, breeding bird surveys. So this is a more or less standard bluebird box, uh, part of the bluebird trail here at McMaster Forest and a wider bluebird box network. Um, this kind is the traditional one you would see in most places. It's got about one and a half inch hole, uh, opens up so that we can do monitoring throughout the uh, breeding season and uh, check in on the birds and see how many eggs they have, uh, clean out the nest when they're done fledging so that the, any parasites in it aren't there for the next nest, and uh, just generally report how many um, breeding pairs we have each year and how many uh, young survive uh, fledging. Um, this is the more standard box though, and uh, we have another box though that's more prevalent here that is a uh, different kind of design, uh, a little bit of an experiment, but uh, seems to work fairly well year to year, and that's over here. So this is this is called the George Coker design bluebird box. George Coker's from Winona, Ontario. He passed away years ago, but um, bluebird all his life, and uh, came up with this design to address a problem in the spring, where if it's raining and the uh, parent comes in and uh, comes into the traditional box after it's been raining when they fluff themselves off all the water, it falls on the young, and they could put them at risk for hypothermia. Uh, whereas this design, the idea is, is the bird puts the nest in back here, and when they come in the front, they uh, shed off all the rain, not over the, the young, but just uh, in another part of the box. Um, and so if uh, sometimes they'll just put their nest at the front, but what we'll do is we'll just move this little uh, block here and move the nest to the back so everything's fine. Um, and yeah, they seem to equally prefer each type. We, we have both types here so they can have a choice, but uh, it seems to be about 50-50. Um, we will get not just eastern bluebird in here, but uh, tree swallow is uh, very common to see in here. And what we'll do uh, to prevent any conflict between that is we always pair these because what will happen then is if they're at least 10 feet apart or so, uh, one species will take one, the other species will take the other. It's too close for two of the same species to tolerate each other, but just far enough away that um, the swallows and bluebirds will tolerate each other um, and not come into conflict. Just gonna go sit and watch us for down on the west side just coming into the ravine edge of the property. We just left the prairie savanna grasslands uh, maybe a minute or two ago and I just wanted to show you the incredible beauty of the creek ravines that are coming off the escarpment here and how beautiful it is with the eastern hemlocks that are always lovely any time of year with the fall, especially in the winter here you see the white and the green from the hemlocks. The, uh, American beech that are very prominent here as well, and um, they, they hold their leaves uh, for a significant period of time, mostly all winter, and they'll start with new growth soon. So join me if we walk a little bit, you can see a little bit now about the, how lovely it is, especially here on the west side. We'll stop here and we'll take a close-up of some of the spring ephemerals uh, coming up, which is uh, early spring flowers, which are beating the uh, tree canopy before it leaves out and they don't get any sun. Spring ephemerals are like trilliums, uh, bloodroot, things like that. And this um, trout lily down here, which is lovely um, yellow flowers. Um, that are coming up. There's quite a bit of it here. And actually they are edible. Um, great for <clears throat> salads, just don't eat a lot of them. But uh, just have a little snack, it's good. Um, so, really nice. So right down here, we have Ancaster Creek flowing. And it's coming from right in the center of our view here where you kind of see a dip in the two tree lines. 
um, and this creek will run all the way down to um, McMaster University. It's a cold water or cool water spring uh, fed creek that has a number of different tributaries that come into it that uh, have cold water fish in them. Uh, one of the notable being trout. Next we see here is this metal farm fencing. So it's the old cattle fencing from the old farm. You can see it grows right through the center of this oak tree showing you just how old it truly is. So it's probably been here for close to a hundred years. And while we're in the area, this is a great spot to point out um, part of the research experiments going on here. So as you walk through the forest, you'll notice a number of these metal aluminum tags that have unique numbers on them. They'll either be affixed with this green plastic tape black zip ties or nailed to the tree depending on what size the tree is. So each number represents this individual tree. So each tag will have its own number for a different tree on it. You'll also notice red spray paint on some of the trees. So that represents the height the trees were surveyed at. So it's called the DBH or diameter at breast height, which is a measurement of the tree and then they'll come back five years later and measure it again. And that tells you forest growth over time. So these represent what's called a Smithsonian research plot or forest plot, which was designed by the Smithsonian Institute down in Panama. And McMaster has one set up here at Mac Forest. It's 500 meters by 400 meters, and it's divided into a grid pattern that's 20 meters by 20 meters and every tree that you see a tag on is individually uh, GPSed in this forest to about an accuracy of one meters. So it's really high quality data to measure forest health over time. So far this project has recorded about 23 to 24,000 trees and it's still counting. So another part of the Smithsonian research plot that you might see as you walk through the forest are these orange capped plastic stakes. And most of them will have this ceramic tag on the top of them. So these represent the corners of our Smithsonian tree plot and the different quadrats that are found within it. So there'll be a stake approximately every 20 meters throughout the entire grid. In this bowl area, at the base of it, we have a spring-fed mineral uh, meadow marsh. So it's a mixture of uh, forbs and grasses, as well as wetland plants, where that mineral marsh meadow name comes from. And it's spring-fed from a number of small little springs on the slopes. And the base of that is actually a pretty high bee biodiverse area as well. It's kind of uh, surrounded by the hawthorn in front of us and rose bushes on the other side of the snow. Okay, we've made our way to the back half of the property of McMaster Forest. And you can see how quite a bit different it looks now. If you look around behind me, there's probably two or three, four acres here of certainly old growth forest. Um, some of the trees we're going to show you are massive. And the aerial photos that we have, I've seen a photo from the turn of the century, 1910 or so. And where the farm was all out front, this was still a forest. So it's a very strong indicator that this was never logged because of its distance from the road and the uh, roadways. So you can see how open it is and how lovely. And it's following me down here a little bit. And as Noah pointed out down there, you can see Ancaster Creek off to my left here. And uh, significant, significant eastern hemlock up here in front of me. But one of my favorite, one of my favorite spots is this old maple. So you can see this very old sugar maple 
And as they used to say on a TV show, look way up, look way up, see how uh, high it is, but how old and how much life it's gone through and the history that tree can tell is amazing. So let's move along the trail. We'll look at some more other significant uh, trees around this uh, back end of the property. So I want, we're going to show you some really amazing trees back here. And this is a black walnut. And we just measured it, the three of us, and it's 4.4 meters circumference around, which is awful big. And I don't think any of us, uh, or even arborist friends we know, have seen a walnut tree that big. So it's quite significant, and I expect it's well over 100 years old, if not way more. Uh, we certainly can only hypothesize, which we're not going to do any tree coring or any things that would impact the health of the tree, but we can only hypothesize by the size of it. A lovely, lovely woman. So another amazing tree we have here in our old growth section is this massive tulip tree right beside me. It's about 3.4 meters in circumference. It's one of the largest tulip trees that any of us have seen here. Tulip tree is a rare species in Hamilton. It's also a beautiful native tree that's great for bees. So this tree is definitely a few hundred years old and is absolutely massive. We're lucky enough to have three trees that are near this size on the property. And just over to the left, we can see a massive hemlock tree. So the old growth section has a lot of hemlocks in it, making it a mixed wood forest. And hemlocks are very slow growing trees. So this tree is definitely very, very old, even if it looks smaller than some of our other trees here. Okay, um, I want to show you this massive red oak that used to stand here. You can see around me how big it is, was, I should say. And I can remember in 2013, when I came out here for a hike, this tree had just fallen, and it was huge. Big red oak had gone down with all the canopy, and you can see from the sides here how long it is, and now it's slowly, through the help of uh, ecology, de decaying, bringing energy back to the soil and the surrounding plant communities. So you can see how much can happen in, what, eight years, how this can decay so quickly. But I can remember when it was a fresh fall, and it was huge. You can still see how big it is just from looking at it as a, you see a remnant. So right here beside me is what's called a wildlife peg tree. So it basically means a large dead stump or tree that is available for wildlife. So a number of birds and insects and bats will nest in tree stumps like these. So whenever we do any hazard trail uh, tree work, we always try to leave trees uh, big and tall like this um, to leave habitat for the wildlife. So this tree was probably an old hemlock before it died. And all these yellow green buds you see around me are the buds of the northern spice bush. So in the springtime or summer, if you came through here and crunched up the leaves in your hand, you get a very strong uh, spicy smell to the, it, where it gets the name from. A cool uh, insect that uses this plant specifically is called the spice bush swallowtail butterfly that only lays its eggs and has the caterpillar on spice bush. And we have the butterfly here in the forest as well. So we've uh, moved out of the older growth forest area at the north end of the property and now we're on the northeast side and you can see a lovely pine tree a couple of them behind me in this old field 
which would have been uh, the far end of the farm cultivated land back. This is the very farthest field. And you can see remnants of farming here with these red raspberries thickets here that could have been come from farm uh, activity because of them. And then over to my left, you see uh, an apple tree that is probably a remnant from the farming that was done here. Um, if you look to my right a little more, and I know Noah had just talked about the uh, spice bush, you can see that yellow hue over there underneath the trees. That is a whole large copse of spice bush that are just coming into leaf and bud now in, in the middle of April. So behind me here, as you see, there's a bunch of fencing in this big square. It's a set of deer exclusion fencing projects run by the Dudley Lab in the biology department. So there's one plot here, there's another plot behind me, and there's other plots throughout the forest. And they're trying to see how deer browsing affects different species of saplings of trees. So they've planted trees within the plot and outside of the plot. And the idea is that inside of the plot, the deer can't eat them, but outside of the plot, they can. And so over time, they'll see which tree species the deer browse the most at different times of the year. And then that'll impact what trees should be planted in areas prone to deer browsing to help with forest restoration. So we're just starting to leave sort of the old growth and mature forest section. And behind me, we've got three massive sassafras trees. So one here, another one here, and our largest one right here on my right hand side. So to find a sassafras tree this big is almost impossible nowadays. You're more used to seeing them really thin sapling size, like seen here. So they'll be like an inch or two in diameter, and that's typical of what you would see in um, Coots Paradise, where there's sassafras everywhere. But we're lucky enough to have three old growth sassafras right here on the property as sort of remnants of what would have been here. So we've just left the sassafras about a few hundred meters down on the trail, and we got into this open area. So it's what's called a woodland savanna habitat, which basically means uh, a canopy cover of between 20 to 60%. So it's not technically a forest characterized by this open area. What we have here is a black walnut woodland savanna. And the understory is what you see here is all this riverbank rye and Virginia rye and a number of different black raspberry trees and some other native grasses. And just in the distance, you can see this is our prairie habitat uh, all near the front of the property. So this is not a very common habitat left on the landscape. We normally either have open fields or closed forests. So woodlands are becoming increasingly uncommon in the area. We're, uh, are we stopping along the trail on the east side of the property as we come up towards the front of Mac Forest lands. And it's such a beautiful view here. I always love this spot, this view along this section of the trail. And you can see this creek below us, which is a small unnamed creek, tributary for Ancaster Creek. It, uh, its source is coming over the escarpment at Shaver Falls, just up in the uh, Meadowlands area up there. And um, I just want to stop here, and as I uh, look over to my left, I see two large white-tailed deer in the forest. I don't think uh, the camera will pick up on that, but they don't seem too spooked by us being here. But it's nice to see, and I hope they're not eating those trees in those little enclosures. Oh, there's four of them, and they were just sleeping.
So one of the amazing things about this property is that it is a B hotspot, both for Hamilton and for the whole province. So since 2014, the Dudley Lab has had researchers out here studying the bee population. So it started with PhD student Sebastian Irazusta, and it's been continued by me for my master's work and some undergraduates as well. So far, we've recorded over 200 species of bee right here at Mac Forest, which makes it one of the most biodiverse areas for bee species in the whole province. So right here at Mac Forest. As you can see here on the ground, you've got a number of bees um, flying around and in this ball here. That is a species called Colides inequalis. It's a cellophane bee that lives in the ground. It's a native spring species. And what you see there is a mating ball with a number of males surrounding one female bee. And the babies will be laid as eggs uh, soon afterwards. Okay, we're, uh, we just came from the old growth forest. We've seen the uh, deer enclosures, the sassafras trees. And now we're back towards the front of the property on the north end of that front. And sitting on a lovely bench here that we put out here for people to enjoy. And you can see off to my right, uh, the back end of the uh, prairie savanna grasslands and uh, how lovely it is here. Um, we just saw Noah's bees here as well. And as Noah is panning around, you can see the escarpment Highway 403 coming down the hill. The apartment buildings, I'm sure some of them from one point looked in. And behind that is Main Street and the, uh, the uh, University of Minnesota. You see how close we are to uh, habitation and buildings, but still how unique and biodiverse this property is in the master forest. So as you make your way out of the property um, along the eastern trail, as soon as you get into our open area again, you'll see this blue roped off area in this big sort of semicircle. And this is protecting a endangered eastern flowering dogwood tree, which is an endangered species in both Ontario and Canada. It's directly in front of me here in the center. It's kind of hard to see, but it's just to the left-hand side of that green spruce tree that you see growing. In the springtime in June, it would have these big, big white flowers that would be covered with bees. Unfortunately, the reason why it's become endangered is both habitat loss and a fungal disease that has been infecting the trees. We only have this one on the property, so we're doing everything we can to protect it by doing this big 25 meter buffer area, which protects the root system of the tree, which can be pretty extensive. So um, one of the projects we do here is the uh, Hamilton Bioacoustics Project. Uh, this here is one of our bioacoustics recorders. Uh, this is called an audio moth. It's a very tiny little thing. And you can see here, it's only just strapped to the tree with a little uh, Velcro. I'm gonna open this up. It's in a protective case. Um, but this is, it's actually the batteries are larger than the device itself. And um, the way this works is, this can be scheduled or it can be running around the clock, depending on how much we wanna record. Typically in the bird breeding season, we'll just have it recording for a couple hours around um, dawn, around sunrise, uh, so that we catch whatever's breeding in a spot because it'll generally be singing. Um, and in the winter, we will set it in a nocturnal, court, er, nocturnal recording so that we can find which owls uh, are in the area and potentially breeding as well. We also have a larger version that's uh, probably about four or five times the size of this uh, called the Swift, made by Cornell University. And that one, it takes big batteries, big D batteries, and uh, we use that generally for more longitudinal studies. We'll keep it running 24-7, 365 days year-round. And all of these get fed through a machine learning uh, program called BirdNet, uh, also developed by Cornell, uh, where they can just take all of our recordings all throughout the year and turn it into sightings uh, based on uh, previously 
recorded species that uh, are known to be in the region and uh, the, the machine learning program has uh, an understanding of. Um, and uh, generally from that, we can then go through and manually check anything we're a little surprised about, verify that the uh, machine learning program is right or not. Sometimes it can be a little bit off, uh, but it does save us an awful lot of time because you don't, if you have 24 seven recording for 365 days a year, you can't go listen to all that yourself. Um, and we found uh, quite a few species that were difficult for us to confirm in the past uh, here. Uh, for example, Acadian flycatcher, very rare species for Canada in southern Ontario that's on the decline. Uh, we've recorded that in our devices and it's been identified um, so as potentially breeding here. It was only a few recordings of it in a particular spot of a male singing, so it's something we're going to pay attention to in future years. Um, in the winters, we've had recordings of uh, long-eared owls, which we have never seen here, but we've now heard here. Uh, and during migration, we've had whippoorwill uh, singing to our recorders, something that uh, has never been seen by a uh, volunteer uh, counting the field here. So very useful for that. And um, I think it'll also come out to be useful in future years for other studies, such as taking a look at the effects of uh, noise pollution, anthropogenic sounds, and how that changes over time. Um, and uh, as well as other species, not just birds, uh, we can record bats. They're kind of hypersonic, uh, high frequency noises they make and sounds they make, uh, as well as amphibians and uh, other vocalizing species. So we also keep track of the breeding bird species here at uh, McMaster Forest. Um, we've had uh, over 50 species confirmed breeding here, over 70 species possibly breeding here, um, and over 163 species have been reported cite cited here or heard here uh, over the years. And um, some of our most common breeding species are things like the field sparrow, which there are not very many sites around this region for. Uh, not very many good sites for them to breed at. Uh, indigo bunting is another one, and we got actually an old probable indigo bunting nest sitting in this hawthorn here. Very prickly plant, but um, birds like, uh, like to nest in those kinds of things because it keeps them safe. Uh, we have um, pretty much every common type of woodpecker breeds here, including the, pili the giant pileated woodpecker. And um, also, obviously, our bluebird boxes that house both tree sparrows or tree swallows and eastern bluebird. And we get uh, lots of ground nesting birds. Um, the field sparrow I mentioned before, the song sparrow. Occasionally, we have a clay colored sparrow come through the region, although we haven't had them confirmed breeding yet. Savannah sparrow, a year to year. Uh, eastern towhee, which is a type of bigger sparrow. Uh, American woodcock, which uh, there are very few uh, sites this close to the city that you can find them at. And uh, yeah, there's quite a high diversity of uh, species that breed and uh, spend the time here breeding during breeding season, generally between April and uh, July each year. As you can see here, we've got one of the four native snake species found on our property. So this is an eastern garter snake just sunning himself in the morning sun. We also have milk snake, brown snake, and red-bellied snakes found here. So it's a great area for reptiles. So we're just coming out on the east side of the trail. So just coming up here on my left. Thank you all for joining us on our tour of Mac Forest. Um, if you do have any questions, we'll be here to answer them. Just so everyone can keep an eye out on what's going on. Um, some up and coming projects for the property are a fully accessible crushed gravel trail that's in the works. That's going to be about 700 meters long. That's going to extend around the edge of our prairie area, um, making it accessible to a wider audience of people. Another big project in the works is a eco field station for research and classes, which will be located right here at the front of the property. Um, it'll be about 2,400 square feet, 
uh, big enough for about a 40 person class uh, that will also have publicly available washrooms. So that's currently in the planning and permitting stage right now. So it's something for you guys to keep an eye out for. The property is open to the public uh, 365 days of the year. Uh, we just try and make sure um, that everyone stays on trail for sensitive ecology and research going on. Uh, dogs have to stay leashed and there's no biking allowed or any kind of collecting or harvesting of plant material. If you guys ever are out here and see something, uh, a species or something else going on that you would like help IDing or wanting more information about, uh, you can feel free to email Wayne or myself. Um, our emails will be made available to you. And there's also more information about the property and other natural lands happening in Hamilton on Nature at McMaster's website. Um, there's more information about conservation areas and other things going on, but also there's a specific page for McMaster Forest that has a number of different drop downs for the history and ecology and research happening in the area. So we look forward to having you come out and visit the property and thanks for tuning in. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jessica Lansbury, and I work in the Office of Alumni Engagement here at McMaster. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you for turning into our virtual hike with Wayne, Noah, and Rob. We hope you enjoyed exploring Master, McMaster Forest. And as noted in the start of the webinar, the virtual hike was pre-recorded back on April 9th and 11th. So McMaster Forest will look a little different now as things are slowly coming to life. McMaster Forest remains open to the public to enjoy, subject to current public health guidelines, including social distancing, staying within your own household group, and not leaving your public health unit. If public health guidance were to close public recreation areas, this could change. So please follow current public health guides, guidelines if interested in visiting McMaster Forest. Additional information can be found at the Nature at McMaster website, which is nature .mcmaster.ca, and the link will be uh, made available in the chat, and we will also send it in our follow-up email, which will likely come out next week with a uh, link to the recording as well. So we now have some time for a few questions, and before we get to the first question, I just want to do a little brief introduction again uh, to Wayne and Noah. Unfortunately, Rob was unable to join us this morning. Wayne Terryberry is the coordinator of outdoor recreation and natural lands at McMaster University and has been leading outdoor experiences and teaching outdoor recreation for 25 years. A leadership facilitator and wilderness guide, Wayne specializes in canoe tripping, trail management, hike leadership, and natural history interpretation. He coordinates natural land and conservation work for the university, liaising with many provincial and international con conservation organizations. He sits on the board of several non-government organizations, including Ontario Trails Council, Coots to Escarpment Eco Park, Hamilton Conservation Authority Advisory Board, and the Grand River Watershed Network. His academic work and research focuses on the history of conservation programs in Ontario and the connection between nature and human well-being. Noah Stegman graduated with Honors Bachelor of Science in Earth and Environmental Science in 2019 and is currently in his second years as a Master's of Science student in the Department of Biology. He's studying native bees and plants in Hamilton with a focus on temporal and landscape effects as well as resource abundance. Noah is currently a Nature at McMaster Coordinator, President and Parks Canada Representative of the McMaster Outdoor Club, a member of the President's Advisory Committee on Natural Lands, and a member of the Coots Escarpment Eco Park Systems Stewardship Subcommittee. He's passionate about outdoors, conservation, and spends his free time exploring the various nature area, natural areas around Hamilton. So if you have questions for Wayne and Noah, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer as many as the time allows. So without further delay, Wayne and Noah, welcome. Um, and I will start off with our first question, um, which is, how are invasive non-native plants impacting the forest? Is anyone at MAC doing studies of native species, both plants and animals? 
So I can take that one away, and if I leave anything out, Wayne can answer. But um, invasive species in the general Hamilton area are a big issue, but Mac Forest is no exception. Um, some of the notable ones are buckthorn, like Wayne mentioned in the video, um, as well as garlic mustard and the emerald ash borer beetle is another big one that's um, killing off the ash trees in a Mac Forest. Um, but we have some management plans in place for some of those things. In terms of research, there was an undergraduate research project studying emerald ash beetles specifically at Mac Forest. And it's a published paper that you can access from our website. Um, in terms of native species, research has been done on fish, invertebrates, um, bees, and trees. So the Smithsonian tree plot, the different um, bee research, and there was a general biomonitoring for a couple of years back in 2015 and 2016 along the creek. Yeah, thanks, Noah. That was a great overview. I might note we are fortunate to not have quite as many invasives uh, other than the ash borer and the buckthorn, but uh, not as much as you might find in Coots Paradise, but we certainly have management plans and work going on to address that like we did with the uh, European buckthorn. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, uh, someone is asking, is this area also known as Coots Paradise or part of the Coots Paradise area or is it a separate area? It is uh, technically a separate area. The Coots Paradise is distinctly the marshlands at the western end of Hamilton Harbor, where the uh, Ancaster Creek, uh, Spencer Creek, and other small creeks flow into um, as a floodplain marshland. But there is this very significant connection between uh, Mac Forest and the Ancaster Creek floodplain below it because it all flows into Coots. The ec ecology and the eco corridor value from Coots Paradise through our lower campus up into Vendas Valley is very interconnected. And even going back geologically, it's all part of the same um, glacial river valley that connects through from uh, Brantford all the way down to Hamilton Harbor. So it, it is very well inter interconnected, but not uh, really officially part of Coots Paradise. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, our next question, um, over the past 25 to 30 years, what are the most significant changes um, overall? Has it been positive or negative uh, to the McMaster Forest property? Maybe I'll start knowing you can jump in on that one. Uh, I would say uh, there's not, not been a lot of significant change. The, uh, I think the major change is the, it, the front area where, as we noted, the, the farm fields and the development really disturb the, the uh, land and allows the invasive buckthorn to come in. And that's what happened over the period of the late 60s all the way to 2013. So that was, I'd say, the biggest change. And then and we, as you saw, were able to clear that out, plant prairie savanna, make it really lovely again. Um, so I think it was good that in some ways it sat vacant because it didn't have a lot of human uh, impact to it. So, which was good and then let nature take its course uh, as long as it's not invasive species like we talked about. But I think uh, we've seen a lot of change in the last little while as we've started to manage it as a nature reserve type of place where we're trying to allow nature to do its thing but trying to deal with the invasives coming in. Uh, Noah, I'll let you maybe add to that. No, I think that was a good summary. It's basically been a mixed bag of positives and negatives. Um, obviously, agriculture has a big impact on the landscape. So that was a thing for a number of years. And then, as Wayne mentioned, agriculture ended. The old hedgerows of buckthorn spread and filled the field. Um, but luckily, that was really the only invasive that we had coming up. And then ever since then, since the early 2010s, um, it's pretty much been all positive with the restoration work the university has been doing. Great, thank you. Uh, someone writes, this might be more of a question for the RBG, but I'm curious about the history of the Ravine Road Trail. As a teen growing up in Westdale, I heard that it 
originally was a dirt road for early cars in the 1920s and 30s. It is unusually wide for a walking trail. So is this always made, this has always made sense to me. Do you have any idea if that's the case? I can certainly speak to that. Uh, it is definitely an old road. And you can see by the uh, foundation it was put down as a, a gravel foundation. It's very wide, has gullies on both sides for drainage. It was access from the King Street area before McMaster was really there and Westdale was developed. It was an access into the farmlands back at the back of the McMaster campus. And I have heard that there was a bit of a uh, landfill dump back in the back part of a uh, 10 acre field behind Ivor Wynn that would have been accessed through that road. So it does make a, a very wide, but very, uh, nice walking trail. And as a uh, gentleman there noted, um, I think it was gentleman, uh, it's a beautiful ravine. It's one of my favorite walks as down ravine road. So I don't know if Noah, you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think that was a good summary. Okay. Uh, the next question is, is deer overpopulation a problem in this area? So, Deer overpopulation is a problem throughout all of Southern Ontario, but Hamilton especially. Um, I believe the current estimate is we have like 300 times the deer density that would normally occur, um, which is why you see very little forest regeneration because they eat all the saplings. Um, it's mainly because there's no predators for them anymore in this area. So yes, it is a major issue, but there's not really much that can be done for it, unfortunately. Well, I might note the Hamilton Conservation Authority has an agreement with the Haudenosaunee and the Six Nations to do uh, bow hunting in Dundas Valley and Iroquois Heights to reduce some of the numbers. And they've had seen very good success with that, uh, trying to uh, eliminate some of the population, but doing it uh, in the non-gun uh, archery bow hunting and the uh, Haudenosaunee make use of the, of the meat, which is incredibly great. So they have a, used that as one mechanism, but as Noah noted, there is no pr predators really around. And uh, so there's quite a few in the valley, in the valley for sure. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there a consultation with indigenous peoples about historical methods of land and forest preservation and protection? We are working very closely with Indigenous Studies Program and the Master Institute, Indigenous Research Institute on mechanisms. And we continually consult with them on ideas. Certainly I can say my ecological knowledge and experience was highly informed by native elders and the, what I learned from them on uh, respecting, appreciating, nurturing and uh, looking at uh, the natural environment as part of who we are. So I think it was uh, very much part of what we're trying to do. Certainly there's not a great deal of, um, we're looking for more information and we're encouraging more research on this. We actually, Noah and I were just talking about a book yesterday on uh, the land learning and in indigenous culture that we're ordering to read. So we're always certainly looking to uh, get advice and engagement. And I'm actually taking uh, some of the Indigenous Studies program out there for a walk as soon as we can at some point. It's on our schedule to do when we are able. So thank you. That's great. Uh, someone asks, are there green funerals allowed in this forest? Noah? So currently that's probably not something that's going to be allowed or encouraged just because there is a public health component to um, doing um, burials of ash, uh, as well as we're trying to leave it as undisturbed as possible. Okay, our next question is, how many acres or hectares, hectares are in the McMaster Forest? So it's just over 115 acres. 
which I think is about 42 hectares around that. And I, I might note, we're looking to, we have a few neighboring landowners who are looking to donate some of their natural land of their properties to McMaster to add to the footprint and the size of McMaster Forest. And we've also begun engaging with other neighbors on both sides of McMaster Forest on, you know, using our, our expertise and our student engagement to do some ecological stewardship work on their natural lands to back behind their properties. So we're looking to increase our engagement. Uh, we do call the whole area from uh, Old Ancaster Road down through behind McMaster Forest and including McMaster Forest down to Lot M and into Coots is kind of the Coldwater Creek Corridor or Ancaster Creek Corridor. And we're working with the Conservation Authority on stewardship initiatives, a trout uh, a stream, uh, Ancaster Creek Stream restoration for trout and various things. So we're looking to do a lot of um, ecological management to assist the uh, natural environment to prosper and to address any human uh, impacts that may have occurred in the past. But we, you know, we are hoping to add to that footprint. It's basically what I'm uh, getting to. Thanks. Great. We've got two more questions here. So the first one is, from where do these invasives come from? So most of them are European invasives um, that came over with the garden industry um, as garden plants and have escaped cultivation. Buckthorn specifically was used as a natural farm fence for cattle and other things because it's very thorny. Um, that's where most of the invasives come from, either garden centers or agriculture. Great, thank you. And our final question, someone writes, in bio 1A7, if I recall correctly, we would walk out from the back of campus to a hillside with a marshy area at the base. Each student had a slice of the hillside to observe for a month as our project, uh, I think it says 1959. Would that have been part of Coots Paradise or the McMaster Forest? That would have likely been part of Coots Paradise on the north end of campus, where we've got campus is kind of at the top of the hill, and then Coots is at the bottom of the ravine. Yeah, I don't think it would have been McMaster Forest. Uh, first of all, we didn't own it then, and it's a little farther from campus. Although the one of the beauties of McMaster Forest, it's just a little ways from McMaster, but uh, students and the, and the McMaster community can access it by car or bus, HSR bus. There is a bus stop just down the street, or they can ride their bikes out there. So it's incredibly accessible for everyone, but a little too far for a lab to walk, but I agree it would have been some of the Coots Paradise area, and I could probably find out exactly where at some point. That's great. So that is all the time for questions we had today, and uh, we hope you enjoyed the virtual hike and learning about McMaster Forest. A very big thank you to Wayne, Noah, and Rob, who was unable to join us live today for taking the time to safely film this for us and teach us about this fascinating piece of McMaster property. Again, a recording will be made available in about a week's time. Uh, you can visit nature.mcmaster.ca uh, for more information. There is a web page there for McMaster Forest that outlines the trails, approximate hike times. And again, we just ask that you follow your local public health guidelines um, if you do plan to visit the McMaster Forest. Um, so just thank gonna, you. Yeah. I'm just going to make a, a, a note when we were doing, when the video was showing and we were showing plants and uh, I, I was showing the, the plants on the ground, the, some, the title said uh, skunk lily. It's actually trout lily. I didn't want any of our naturalists here to think I didn't know what I was, but it, it was, couldn't hear very well, but it, I, I just wanted to clarify it's trout lily and not skunk lily, just for- Great, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, we can, <laughs> yeah. We can make that change yeah. up to our little- well, We hope everybody goes, goes out there and explores. It's a lovely property. And as Noah said, there's a lot of information on Nature at McMaster website and lots of the uh, studies that were that Noah had referenced. So. Uh, I know on behalf of Noah, we hope everyone has a great weekend and hope to see you around uh, Mac Forest or at campus. Thank That's you. That's great. Thank you both for uh, taking the time today to give this talk to us and we hope you all have a safe and enjoyable long weekend.